uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are across the known world, and welcome to another exciting interview on The Crown Between Two Roses. Uh, today, uh, we have Condessa Catalina with us, and I'm Countess Beatrice, and please bear with me as we do our acknowledgement of country. Good nobles, we come together in the spirit of fellowship, deepening of our skills, sharing our knowledge, and a shared interest in the search for truth to find truth through experimental archaeology and historical inquiry. It is in this context that I, Countess Beatrice, on behalf of my kingdom, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we gather. We recognize their continuing connection to land and culture and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Thank you very much. And today we're very excited to be uh, interviewing Duchess Dagmer, I probably got that wrong, from Antia and her crazy apprentice, Nida. So welcome. I don't know about crazy. You, you, you said that she was crazy, so that's what we're rolling with. All right, she's a little, <laughs> I mean, like a crazy quilt. Crazy quilt. Yeah, like a patchwork, I think that's. Full of all that. different kinds of goodness. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, the big things that we do uh, on Crown Between Two Roses is about origin stories. So can you tell us how you came, became started in the SDA? Well, I'd like to first acknowledge that I am currently on the traditional lands of um, the Coast Salish and still Guamish people of the Pacific Northwest or what's now known as the Pacific Northwest and also acknowledge um, that uh, the relationship we have with the, pe the tribal um, peoples of this area has not always been an honest one, and that we strive to um, to be better than the treaties that were broken. So thank you for the your land acknowledgement, and um, thank you for letting me add mine. Um, thank you. So the um, the area that I'm currently living in, and where Nita first became my apprentice. It is modernly the Pacific Northwest of the United States or Ontier. Um, and Ontier is a very large uh, kingdom geographically, which of course I'm saying that to you and your kingdom's enormous, but um, relative to other continental US, um, North American um, uh, kingdoms, um, we not only are big in terms of geography, but also in terms of population. So we have many, um, um, metro cores in our kingdom. And I've always lived sort of downtown on tier um, in the, which is, would be in the greater Seattle Olympia area um, on the, on the coast of Washington state. Um, I started in the SCA when I was um, a, in my second year of college at a school known as the Evergreen State College in Olympia. And at that time, the group was just becoming a barony. And they were kind of going through this wonderful surge of creating culture and, you know, creating their identity as a group. It was a really cool time to get involved with a local group. Um, and the reason I found out about it was because I was living in the dorms and somebody was sitting outside of our window. Uh, we were on the ground floor, obviously, and was making a lot of noise. And I said, what are you doing to this person? And he, um, there's an airplane going overhead, which is gonna get really loud in a second here. I have the windows open, so, okay, there we go. Uh, it's probably an Amazon plane, because we're in Seattle, and we're on the flight path of all the Amazon planes coming in out of our airport, so. Um, so the person who was making all the noise is now known as Sir Martin La Harper, who is one of my very good friends, and he, um, he and I became fast friends then as well. And we, he introduced me to the SCA and to Bardic and, you know, all these fun things. And his lady at the time taught me to use a sewing machine. And, you know, it's just sort of a period of time when we have the energy and um, appetite for <laughs> those types of things. So I think if I had found the SCA later, it would have been a lot tougher to put all that creative energy into it. But then, um, I mean, that was really where it started for me. And because of the friends I had, I got to swim in waters that were, you know, 
creative and interesting and there were um, lots of opportunities to come in contact with the crown, which I know is not something everybody in every kingdom gets to do, but in Ontir, we have travel funds that are allocated for the crowns and there's a definitely a culture of trying to get around a lot during the rains. And um, so, you know, that was really cool. It meant that I got both that local and the more sophisticated sort of kingdom level experiences pretty early on. And I was, I was totally, I was totally stuck. The SCA was like going to be a really meaningful place for me from then on. So um, I have since then lived in Ontario. I've lived in the West Kingdom. Um, I was down there for a period of time. And that is where I um, had the opportunity to reign as princess of the principality of Snagua. Um, so uh, we all have that Western um, origin story, you know, all coming from the West. Of course, Ontario was part of the West too before um, it became a kingdom. So we're all kind of cut of that cloth. And um, so um, I reigned with Sir Obadiah the Obstreperous, who was um, just one of the very best humans this planet has ever known and has since passed. Um, but he, he was really um, a special person. And um, so that was extraordinary. And I was made a laurel in the West. Um, and that didn't, I've never felt like that was something I really earned or deserve. So the imposter syndrome has followed me around for a long time, but I use it to help encourage other people to overcome their sense of um, insecurity and inferiority. Um, and then I came back to Ontario and um, reigned a couple times here as queen with my now spouse, um, Thorin Nielsen, and we have a wonderful 13 year old. And I have some great apprentices left in my castle of apprentices, of which Nita is one of them. I'm super privileged to get to, um, I don't know about teach her, mentor her. It's more like, don't get in her way and um, <laughs> try and reconcile the fact that she's incredibly talented, but living in China where she does not have any meaningful day-to-day -day access to the SCA. So. Eventually, we'll get her back stateside and can, you know, make sure she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. So I have to just assume she is right now. So, Nita, it's your turn. Yes. Okay. So, um, when I came to the SCA, I was a new mother. My husband had, we'd moved to Kitsap County from like the Spokane area. So, from like Eastern Washington to Western Washington. And he was a new teacher at the same time as a bunch of our friends were new teachers and they had moved up from the Outlands, which is um, New Mexico area in the United States. So we had known nothing of the SDA. And um, then we just started hanging out with them and they were talking about it all the time and it sounded like a lot of fun. And I really liked to play dress up. So as an adult, I got to make costumes. I learned how to sew. Um, and I went to several events as a camp mom and my husband was a fencer. So it became tedious rather quickly to be in camp. And it seemed like um, I wasn't really introduced to the world beyond camp or just like the side of the fighter field for a long time. And I was at a local baronial event and I was talking to a woman under a day shade and I was like, I don't know, I think this might be my last event. Um, it doesn't really seem to be for me. And she was like, well, what do you like doing? Cause she had been in the West and she said, oh, well, there was a woman who used to do puppeteering and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wait, there's puppeteering. There's other stuff, arts and sciences because I just really hadn't been exposed to it. The group of people I was with, they were fighters or fencers. So they, I didn't really look beyond my friend group. But from there, I started entering baronial bardic and arts and sciences competitions. I started doing puppetry research, which um, has really 
kept me in the SDA. So I started doing a lot of um, puppet shows. Then when I, I have uh, started my research and then I branched out and I wanted to practice making puppets, but uh, my husband is afraid of them. So I had to get them out of the house. So I thought as practice, I would make a pair of puppets for each reigning couple. So I started doing that. So there's um, going back to 2007, I think there's a pair of puppets. And I will tell you the first, oh, several reigns were hideous and terrifying. <laughs> and people were the like- puppets. Oh, puppets, not the, the puppets. people reigning, the puppets. Okay. Yes, the puppets. Puppets were terrifying, <laughs> and uh, I had to get to the point where I could talk to the royals before I made them so that I could find out, like, some people really hate dolls, and some people only want to see animals, and some people, so I've done many iterations from glove puppets to marionettes, and most recently, shadow puppetry, and the shadow puppets are really where I think I've found like that's where my art has peaked. There's definitely the most research for shadow puppets, medievally speaking. So there's much more to go on and feel authentic. Whereas the Punch and Judy shows, while they are documented, it's, it's really difficult to, I don't know, feel legitimate because they all seem and feel so modern. Mm. And um, after puppetry, I did a Kingdom Arts and Sciences or a Kingdom Bardic competition and I won. And ever since then, after being a Kingdom champion, I rolled into being the Kingdom Arts and Sciences Minister for Ontier, a job which I loved. And I had to leave early because we moved overseas. And that was a really, really hard decision. But we got some great advice that we should go and live our lives and do what's best for our family and the SCA will be there when you come back. Mm -hmm. And it has been, we've come back every summer and I usually plan some sort of antics to keep people entertained um, <laughs> and make my presence known. But <laughs> if you can't hear me coming, <laughs> then <laughs> that's really on you. <laughs> it's cacophonous. <laughs> When you've got have, all yeah. the bells on. I have a suit of bells that's over, I would say, 70 bells. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah it definitely won't be creeping very far in that. Not in an outdoor event, but in an indoor event, I have managed to sneak up on several people. Wow, that's, that's quite impressive. Lighting. <laughs> <laughs> so how did the two of you uh, uh decide to enter into that kind of formal uh apprentice uh mistress uh, relationship <laughs> i mean it's a good question um i don't it, it was after was it after my last reign yes because you did retinue. Yes. So that's how we met, that's how we met which is um, a great way to figure out how useful someone will be as your future <laughs> mentee. <laughs> um, but also uh, Nita is, you know, I, I always have an appetite for taking on people that their art is not well understood or where they're doing things that other people might not know how to evaluate it. Um, I like I like that. I like sort of the challenge of that. I will say, I'm just gonna be really blunt about this. Mm. Like Nita, it, it, her stuff is hard for people to understand. You know, it's part performance art and part art art other art. I mean, people are like, well, we don't know. And it's like, they don't see the depth of research because the, everybody, it's sort of like people think they know what puppetry is, or they think they know what gestures are, because they have a, a sort of a vision of it that's 
based on their experiences, but they don't realize um, how much of that is modern and. Um, so they're just looking at it at face value rather than delving mm -hmm. into it. Yeah. Right. So they think they know a lot about it, but they really don't. I think that's a, an issue. And also, um, you know, Nita has spent a lot of time with her shadow puppets in particular, not just um, designing the puppets, but the materials, like really diving into how the materials were done. Um, she even uh, got inspired to make some fish leather. That was kind of exciting. Um, I'm glad I wasn't there for it because it I'm sure it smelled horrendous. But um, because of some of her work around um, the, some of the colors that may have been used in the shadow puppets may have been translucent fish skin that had different colors, that, you know, or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. she can speak for herself, but I just, I love how curious she is. And mm -hmm. um, we have a great fit in terms of our personalities. I think we both have our own ways of stirring pots. Um, I, I'm a little more overt when I'm like, hey, I'm gonna do this thing. And she, she's more, she's sneakier. People don't realize how subversive she is until it's already happened, which I adore. Um, and we've done shenanigans together that are pretty high value. Um, like that's what I like to hear. <laughs> yeah, we, one of my favorite things that we got involved in because I don't know what the timeline on this was Nita, but when we did the interviews with the video camera, that was a September crown. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had been working with Atias on um, the on tier news. So right, I think so I might have already started shooting some of the clips. And then he we came up with the idea of doing some on the spot interviews, but nonsensical ones, not like the there are people that do like fighter right. interviews and they're funny, but they're also pointed at ours. Was, this was a year, this was years ago. This was like before, this was like with a video camera and yeah. And it was for stuff to air um, during our um, hotel events, like on tier 12th night, okay. to air on the closed circuit or whatever, the hotel television channel. So I was like, oh, okay, let's go do that. So we walked around and I used a spoon as a microphone and we asked people really dumb questions. Like, I love like that idea. Sprays or loincloths, you know, or... I don't even remember. It was dumb. It was not, this was not a sophisticated moment, but it, it was, was super fun. And fun. <laughs> yeah, it was super fun. And it aired more than one year. People are like, oh, I saw you. And I'm like, oh my God, we're never going to live this down. But it was really <laughs> fun. It was really fun. So I think um, we, we definitely have great chemistry around that kind of stuff. And you know, aren't afraid to, I think together we are not afraid of the kind of trouble that we're capable of, which is fun. Um, yeah. yeah. So I also try to keep uh, my apprenticeship under wraps in some cases to be more covert. So I used to, I have a wooden frame that I go around at night and I take what I call vigil frame photos, but um, since I'm only around in the summer events, it's not really a vigil frame anymore. It's just being framed, but it's like a scroll work. It's wood, it looks nice and old timey. So I just go around and I say, here, hold this. And then I take their picture and oh, then yeah. over and over and over. So I have uh, probably most of on tier for a few, a few years. Um, there's lots of people who have been framed by Nita. So there's <laughs> the jokes that are there, but it, I mean, there's no reason for anybody to not feel comfortable or I feel like approachability is something I like to maintain and keep. Definitely. So just random silliness. Uh, I learned early on when I started wearing Jester um, garb that I didn't have to do anything other than show up and people would see me and they would smile. 
They didn't have to know who I was. They didn't have to see me do anything funny or cute. It was just, mm -hmm. oh, look at that clown. Hilarious, I'm smiling. <laughs> and so I kind of played on that. I just really like to make people smile. And so now it's sort of become a thing that anytime I think of an idea or something that I think, oh, a lot of people will like this. So I just kind of take it and run with it. I used to do a lot of um, dispensing of beverages and I've done it in several different ways. I like to keep people hydrated or libated depending on their choice. <laughs> so um, it used to just be a box of wine that I carried in a like a canvas bag at court. And that went okay for a while until I was told I wasn't allowed to do that. Um, at, at court, that was the issue. So then I just started taking it off road. So um, one summer, the first summer we were gone in Turkmenistan for two years. The first summer we came back, I built a big paper mache horse in the style of like the German 14th century carnival. So it just sort of like fits over my waist. And it was made out of a baby Moses basket and a big paper mache horse head that I made. And I filled the back of it with um, boxed wine, but I took it out of the box and it makes these convenient little bladders. So I <laughs> was able to put them in the, in the back of the horse so people could self-serve as needed. And then Dagmar made up funny names for the type of beverages that they were. Do you wanna share those names? <laughs> nice. I'm <Yeah>. loving this. <laughs> <laughs> you share. So one of them is uh, Chardonnay. <laughs> but then I can't, what would we, what did we call the other one? I don't remember. Was it a Pinot? It was probably a Pinot or a Moscato, but I don't remember. Pinot Grigio, was that what it was? Maybe. I don't remember, but I. It but it was very funny. Wine. I would not serve anything other than white wine out of the horse. He rejected some of my other suggestions. I did. So, um, and that's a pity because it would have been probably really appropriate, like a Bruges painting or something. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So um, it was it was brilliant and heavy. So she really, that was a service she was performing to walk around with Chardonnay <laughs> in her butt. Um, well, not my butt, the horses. Well, one of, but one of my favorite moments with you was the, I think the next year or the year after you came back and you didn't have the hobby horse. And so you had an inflated um, pool, inflatable. Yes. It was, was a, a flamingo, was and a I flamingo. only did it after dark because I didn't want to ruin the day event. But it was it was kind of meta because it, only people who knew that she had previously worn this horse around would mm -hmm. understand that this was the next sort of Pokemon incarnation of that mm -hmm. was this inflated, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise she just would have been walking around with a pool inflatable. That was really brilliant. And we were we were standing around i remember um tasia and some other people watching you interact with people which is super fun and there were people playing bocce at night um it's common in ontario for people to play glow in the dark bocce at night okay. and um we were kind of talking to these strangers doing this and i said ada you should go roost on one of their bocce on one of the balls <laughs> And it's part of what I love about her. The Jester uh, outfit that goes with that was that it had a coxcomb. So there was a bit of a bird element and the inflatable was a flamingo. Right. So there so was she, sort of like already a bird element happening to what was going on. So she ran so out I into the bocce field and, and sat on one of their balls. And they're like, 
uh, excuse me, milady. Like it was really funny. And we're like, oh no, no, you can't disrupt her. It's an endangered species. So <laughs> 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 set the habitat. And they were just like, what are we supposed to do? It was, it was great. It was a, it was one of my favorite Nita stories because she had she didn't even hesitate. She's like, of course she's gonna run out there and roost on one of the balls and <laughs> made, made it us. It was a little one. It, it wasn't one of the light up ones. Yeah, yeah. it was awesome. really funny. Nita, um, we've had some questions coming through about jester garb. People are uh, seem really interested in finding out about that. Do you have? Um, do you want to give us a little? taste of what you've done and where people can go to find out more about your research or anything you're happy to share with our lovely audience? Um, sure. I, uh, when we were in the live journal days, there was a woman who had put together just like a, a whole bunch of um, woodcuts and paintings and images of jesters doing this or that are allegorical, they're not literal, jester, like with the, the hood and the cap, like you would see. So sometimes when it's a jester and the king or when the king is the fool, it's hard to prove that like anyone literally was wearing things like this in as much as we see. But I do know that there are also extant caps, there are extant jester's baubles, the jester's baubles are like a scepter that you would hold and they were often carved to look like the jester. So some of them are wearing like just a regular brimmed hat, like a cavalier hat. And so a jester didn't always have the hood and the horn and the ears and the coxcomb and the bells. They were um, a variety of things. And so often I will just wear whatever garb I feel comfortable in. And then I just add a jester's cap. So under my hood, this is what I have. It's called a quiet cap because this one has no bells. But it's got like the, I liked this little moon part at the top and two ears. And if they can stick up or hang down, I just look at all the images that you can find. Sometimes uh, medieval playing cards will have images of the fool as like the, the one or the zero card in medieval get card games. And that's where we got the inspiration to make this yellow bedspread velvet jester coat. So it's from one of those images. But um, I usually just look at the pictures that I find, the images, the paintings, the portraits, and then I think about what would be the most fun or comfortable or easy to wear around. I will say that sometimes walking around in a jester cap with bells on it can be a bit deafening. Even wearing the cap over your ears dampens a lot of sound. So I don't always hear so well at events. So if people talk to me and think I'm ignoring them, I'm not, I just don't hear you probably hey, with Nina. all the bells. And then people think it's cool to come up and smack my ears, which oh. I don't like but you can't stop them. Nita, yeah. maybe you could throw a link up um, in the comments after the interview to your okay. research page. Oh yeah, um, I have a page with all, it's just nita.weebly.com, I think. I'll put the link later. Yeah, and that way people can kind of follow along. Um, and we also, Ontier has an Ontier culture wiki. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, Nita has a lot of content up on the wiki too, including a great photo of her with her hobby horse. Um, yeah. So. And there's a Facebook page, Anita Ritarelli Facebook page that links to all my research and mm -hmm. pictures and fun stuff. Yep. Awesome. And there's so, even a correspondence clown college that you can sign up for. Oh, wow. So. But much like the one in bed knobs and broomsticks, you know, you have to <sighs> wait a while between between classes. So. Um. <clears throat> yeah. Well, Nita's, Nita's definitely um, a, a, a jewel in the, the clown crown of Ontier and um, 
has done some restitution on behalf of all clowns in the esteem in which we hold them. So um, <laughs> I, I don't like clowns. And so the fact that I ended up with one as an apprentice is probably some kind of karmic twist, but um, I thought she was a puppeteer. I didn't know. No, I'm kidding. Of course I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I can do two things. But it's worked yeah. out pretty well. Yeah, it has. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm really interested in leaning into some of the performing arts aspects of the SCA. Um, so it's possible that in the future we might, if we do lure her back to um, our continent, maybe we'll do some stuff together. So that would be really fun. That would be And awesome. now that I said it publicly, it has to happen. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I'm um, undergoing a chrysalis-like um, transformation um, mm -hmm. where I quit my job and have entered into grad school to become a special education teacher. Oh, you. In yeah, so, and so it's neat because I have all these friends who are teachers, including Nita, um, to go to for reassurance or whatever the opposite of reassurance is <laughs> about the teaching profession. But also it, it's, um, it, it's, there are a lot of teachers in the SCA up here. Um, and I, yeah. I think that's probably common in a lot of places, but here, like, there are so many public school teachers in um, on tier and um, it's a neat community um, you know it's a it's I think says a lot that teachers find the SCA a satisfying place to be too um, because of all of the really wonderful opportunities we have to teach I I need it. I've actually been in one of your classes where we made creepy marionettes that I never finished. It's still sitting in a box somewhere, but um, I, I'm with your husband. Like some puppets are really creepy and marionettes always make me think of Thunderbirds, which while I liked it when I was a kid, it, it also was really creepy to me. So that's, <laughs> his opinion is not without merit. So. <laughs> Anita, will you be teaching an online uh, creepy marionettes class? Cause I need to sign up for that. Mm. Well, I mean, I could teach an informational one, but I mean, as a class, the one that Dagmar took was I had prepared um, kits with wooden pieces so you could carve and then articulate your, your own marionette. Um, I'm not sure how that would go online, <laughs> but you I might definitely think about, informational. You might think about doing it with a, a substance other than wood, like maybe have people do it out of foam or something that so they can get the feel of it down. Um, Cause for me, the biggest obstacle was yeah. carving wood cause I was not a wood carver, um, but yeah. you know, maybe there's something else. But I think um, the cool thing that Nita does is she tries really hard to make things as accessible as possible. And um, when I lived in Glamere before the barony I lived in before like way back when we were first barony, we had a lot of people that um, were kind of afraid to do any kind of public performance, um, didn't consider themselves performers. And the barony had a very pun-based culture, lots of baronial puns, funny puns, some of them not so funny. So, um, so we devel developed a performance group called the Humming Bards and we had, it was, it's, reason for existing was to get people comfortable with performing and so it needed to be kind of silly and I was the big bard and so um yes yellow feathers featured I had a hood <laughs> had a yellow hood with feathers on it and we would do things like um everybody would learn a song together and we would perform publicly as a group so people were like oh there's 10 other people singing so you know, it, it helped. And we would um, make up really dumb filts. We did, um, we did ha spam a lot before it was a thing. <laughs> no, what did we say? We did ham a lot. We did ham a lot. Ham a lot. Nice. And we all had felt pig noses on sticks. 
we held in front of our faces and sang about Camelot. So we did, some of it was pretty dumb, but um, it helped, you know, some people who had never really been performers and they gained confidence. And I think part of what attracted me to Nita when we were first talking about, you know, the kind of relationship we could have in the SCA is that she has a lot of that same sort of drive to make sure that people know that something is doable. And, you know, I that's a value I really have in the SCA too. It's like, no, you can do this, you know, will it look the same or will it, will you do it in the, in identical way? No, of course not. And you shouldn't try to because it's yours, but I really appreciate that about Nita. Like, no, anybody can do this. And in fact, my other apprentices are kind of, if I, I think that's maybe a unifying feature of all of them is that they're all like very invested in making things accessible to people. Um, you know, trying to lower barriers to, um, to involvement, um, you know, trying to, it's like you can have both high standards and do things that are easy for other people to learn how to do. And I really like that, so. Nita, I wanna hug you. Well, I did make a marionette out of toilet paper tubes. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. So but that's what you had. We can do that. Everybody has some toilet all around. Yep. So that's very cool, you know? So I love that. I love that kind of stuff. And it, it does. The other, the other thing that I really appreciate about Nita's gesture research is that she has done a lot of work looking at some of the less savory side of how gesturing was um, formed, approached, the people involved that um, are things that we don't really want to have any business doing in the SCA. So the way that it um, handled people with disabilities or um, especially with people with intellectual um, disabilities and how um, you know, her research has really kept her you know, in the right, sort of on the right side of that discussion. Um, do you wanna talk about that at all, Nita? I can. Um, in there's Beatrice Otto's book is uh, uh, Fools Around the World, and she has classifications of types of fools. So there's the artificial, and the natural fool is characterized by handicap or disability or deformity. They were other in the society. And so often a town or a king or a church, they would care for these people. And part of what the motley garb, the made of like patchwork and patches, that was a key feature on a natural fool because they were given clothing that was sturdy because they didn't behave in a manner that would keep their clothes neat and tidy and like so they they were given a, a different type of clothing and also it was sort of to mark them as cared for so there were often in medieval times if a person was mad or had some sort of mental illness they might become a wild man those are things that we read about in medieval texts the wild man or the person who just lives on the outskirts of town but a person who was cared for by someone was usually known by a hood or motley clothing or, or they were kept kind of like pets. The Medicis had monkeys, but they also had um, little people. And so they're kind of the same in the pictures, but in better cases, they could be a friend or a confidant or something that they truly cared about. And in worse cases, they were just sort of tolerated and fed and clothed. And so I really try to stay away from any type of foolery that makes people feel bad about themselves or made fun of. If I'm gonna make fun of someone, it's going to be myself or someone above my rank who I think can take it. So, or invites it, right? Because sometimes or invites, yeah, there's many a time where a knight will poke fun at me and I will poke it right back. 
and they generally think that's all in good fun and it is but i would never uh, poke fun i don't like a anything that makes it feel bad like i if it makes you uncomfortable then you shouldn't be doing it and if you have a voice inside of you that says that was too far you need to apologize immediately so i just kind of think i try to think of things that are going to bring a smile, a real smile, one that will stay on a person's face and not a smile of bravery that they put on because you've made a joke at their expense and they're gonna smile, but then they're gonna turn around and then be sad about it or upset later. So I try to always be doing things that are not mocking in a, I wouldn't mock, people who are disabled or differently abled or, and I don't enact that type of fool. I have met people or talked to people who do like a lot of the little boy gross out humor. Um, and I yeah. don't really do that either. It's not my style of fool. I'm definitely an artificial. So um, People who are also referred to as jesters are court musicians or people that sometimes did beautiful poetry or music. So being a jester doesn't have to be the fool. It can also be classy mm -hmm. or funny or um, a king would often keep a fool as a confidant. There's many stories of the fool bring, being the one person who sort of brings perspective to a situation. And I like to do that too. I have a funny camp story about sitting when I was on a different retinue and a king was going on and on about, um, we were at a site that was shared with some civil war reenactors and he just kept going on about this and that, oh, and you, they had this and they won't let you have a can of Coke and they don't let you this and the, and it was just so odd and surreal. And I just looked at him and I waited for him to stop speaking. And I said, yes, your majesty. And then he was quiet for a moment. And then he just started laughing. And those are the times where I'm either about to be banished from camp or make a new friend. <laughs> <laughs> the king took it well. And was like, you do not realize you are now mocking these people for taking everything too seriously as you sit here in your crown. Anyway. Taking things serious. So, if I can bring perspective to a situation or if people are taking themselves too seriously. It was a lot of, I think as arts and sciences minister, I, I did a lot of work to meet and talk to as many people as possible because not being a peer, I was not in a lot of conversations that I think many people who hold high offices in the kingdoms take for granted because a lot of them are peers. So they know what goes on in the meetings and they know what the perspectives are. Mm -hmm. And I really haven't been in the kingdom for, I mean, now I have been in Ontario for a couple of decades almost, but I had to spend a lot of time talking to anyone who would listen to me, asking them, what do you like about this? Uh, whether it was arts and sciences competitions or whether it was the kinds of classes that were offered. I just wanted people to tell me what it was that they wanted or why a lot of times I got to learn a lot about why things were the way they were. Mm -hmm. And then, so I got a better understanding and I could respect like these people who have been the core of bringing the arts and sciences and maintaining it have a lot invested. So when you wanna talk about change, it's hard for them because they have an ownership or a, this is mine and we spent hours and days and weeks and months making this what it is and now you just want to change it and start over because a few people aren't happy and i just wanted to be able to bridge the gap between what was and what needed to change or what could be changed that would allow for more people to feel comfortable in those spaces i think that's really important because we don't gain anything by just by allowing the investment of time to become the main reason that we stay, we keep something, right? Um, that's, not, that's, that's not how organizations thrive. Organizations thrive when we do things that are relevant to the people who are here now. Mm -hmm. um, 
at the same time, there's always a tendency, I think, when you have people who are doing work that's underappreciated, and you've, you know, anyone who knows me knows that I talk a lot about unpaid labor that's usually borne by women and people of color who are expected to do a lot more um, to keep um, organizations going, like especially ours. Um, and so when you have those dynamics and you have people who are like, well, I'm already underappreciated. So my work, the product is everything, you know? And if you, if you take that away, not only was I not appreciated for doing it, but now the very thing that I was invested in has also been taken away. So what, where am I, who am I, what value do I have? And so I think, uh, I think there's that always at play and we lose sight of um, the fact that we still have to have a functioning organization. Um, so rather than preserving things that aren't working, we definitely need to go all the way back and say, wait, maybe we need to not be putting people in the position of doing so much without being appreciated for it in the first place. And that will help downstream make the changes feel um, like they're more welcome by everybody, right? So. Yeah. And it's quite an interesting time right now for that to be happening as well. Yep. Lots of conversations happening about this because yeah. who has kept the SCA going during the pandemic? You know, lots of people have been yeah. doing lots of things, but nobody is really seeing it. They just know that websites keep operating and, you know, um, rules and things, stuff keeps happening. Communications are happening. You know, there are people that are making culture happen online, mostly women. And, you know, there's lots of things happening. And I'm not saying that men don't contribute. I'm just saying women contribute too. And often they're doing a lot of work that's not appreciated. And yeah. so if we can do a better job of showing how much we value that. Um, I think it'll. I think it'll help a lot of problems later. So yeah, there's definitely a visibility thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know working in the background is quite. It, it takes a lot of time. I've been lucky. I've been away for a few weeks, and I've I have had an acting um, seneschal, kingdom seneschal, in my stead who has done an amazing job. But it's it's definitely an invisible job you don't see out on the front out in the public eye what is actually happening and how much work is going on in behind the scenes unless you ask right right um yeah the seneschals kind of got a rough deal the last year and a half you know and i'm thinking about the fact that like these offices are supposed to have a start and end <laughs> how did that Best time last First of March, just saying. <laughs> Time is broken right now. I, I'm convinced that it, it's, yeah, it makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine what it's like to actually rain right now too. That's just intense to think about, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know though. I think like in Ontario, we had sort of laid some groundwork over time that made it easier you know we're certainly we're in a tech tech hub you know so in the past we so we in the laurel council at least um and i think there's been broader conversations we're talking a lot about equity and how the the sca frequently does not is not equitable in terms of access and the way that we evaluate people's service the the way that we that we weigh the the relative contributions that you know we have there's so many things especially when you think about peerages there's so many things that are sort of subjective in terms of evaluating someone's readiness for a peerage and yeah. so from an equitable standpoint we would be taking into consideration the relative cost to a person and we do a very poor job of that and and we also don't always look at um so for example nita was talking about being a new mom entering into the sca 
we don't think about the fact that the things that make the SCA worthwhile often are the ways in which we're able to fully integrate parts mm -hmm. of our lives like mm -hmm. family into the mm -hmm. SCA. Yeah. And when people do that successfully they're, and they're able to like their family is playing or they're able to meet, maybe even keep a sharp definition between their family and the SCA, that all costs. And it's mostly women who bear that cost irrespective of your age, because you're more likely to see that it's the man in the family who's fighting. So that's a dynamic that continues to be a problem. There's just a lot there, but also in on tier, and you probably experienced this too, it's the mere fact that it, the gas prices here are outrageous. And the, it, 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 traffic has gotten so bad here because of population increase in our in our metro areas that um, it takes a really long time to go places now. So up and down our main freeways, the corridors that run through our kingdom, you know, at one time it might have taken you an hour to get somewhere and now it can take two and a half hours. Depending yeah. on where you're going. Ours is the the travel is definitely a, a factor across our kingdom. Right. You know, we've got two countries really right. and we don't have a, um, a physical border it's it's all um water. Yeah, water yeah yeah it's, a, it's, the, it's the type of physical border that actually is meaningful yeah you know <laughs> where you literally can't go there without you know a plane yeah. ticket or yeah yeah well you can't go anywhere without a plane ticket Really, right. um, and you can't really go many places with a plane ticket right now, can you? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, the, especially, especially yeah. right now, where yeah. uh, mm -hmm. we're experiencing and we and a bit of a COVID up. We mm -hmm. share <laughs> that because, of course, we have part of Ontarians in Canada. Yes, mm -hmm. part of Ontarians in Canada, and our border has been closed since right after the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yeah, we I I think we have a lot in common in that regard. Um, and what the other thing that that means is that when people, people who have the types of jobs where they get time off, they get vacation days, they get, or maybe they have a flexible work arrangement and they have the resources to travel become privileged mm -hmm. in ways that aren't a true reflection of their abilities or passions. And it, it, we've also just raised the bar so much where, you know, if you don't have a period pavilion, sometimes people just don't take you seriously here. Mm. And, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It can really that, be that, that privilege and that ability to get renown in your kingdom is, is right. dependent on your ability to get to events and spend time at events and to raise your um, visibility, which may not, right. pay, not be your thing because you might be a paper right. person. <clears throat> what we used to call a paper laurel, laurel yeah. or um, or you could just be shy or not or have a, a free time. A fish leather laurel. You could be a fish leather laurel. <laughs> Play your cards right there, Nina. Yeah. yeah. So, but I think expanding it really, that is great. Yeah, it really affects people with children too in ways mm -hmm. where it's just, it makes it so much harder. We have, so to drive, before Avocal became a kingdom, people were regularly coming down from Avocal. It's like a 13, 14 hour drive, you know, and we have, we have main kingdom events that require, you know, a minimum of six, eight hours in a car, which yeah. that's not to go very far, you know? So people who can't take time off work, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff. So one of the things that I think is really hopeful about the pandemic is that we've, lowered some of those bars permanently now and able to you know really think about the fact that there are people that um meaningful participation has been limited by their resources and you should not have to you know earn you know upwards of eighty thousand dollars a year to be in the sca in the us <laughs> that's ridiculous like or why anyway. yeah Finding oh, new ways of, of getting people to participate and feel like they have agency in their own game. Is that kind of what you're, you're yeah, saying? That's a big part of it. So it's even like we um, in the past tried to use things like Skype 
to make it so that our Laurel meetings could be held, you know, our Laurel meetings that were between kingdom events. So we have a regional system here where um, different areas, we have our own meetings and then we make recommendations to, um, for a kingdom discussion based on those regional discussions. Well, our local region, it was becoming really difficult for people on a weeknight to move to the meetings. And so we tried to do online meetings, but the technology just was pretty bad mm -hmm. and we, we couldn't manage it. And now we could absolutely do online meetings. There's no question. And why would we go back to in-person for everything? You know, that there's no reason for us to do all in-person regional Laurel meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so from an equity standpoint, I'm all for it. I also think that we have an obligation to be considering our carbon footprint and the impact on the planet and to be more thoughtful about the way that our kingdoms, when they are so huge, why do we have one kingdom that's so giant? What barriers are in place to just make the kingdom smaller? And I think that's really important. And we need to just be thinking about it more holistically and less in a territorial way. You know, is it serving the people of your kingdom to be giant, a giant kingdom? And I, I think the answer is no. And it's not, it's not equitable. And it, you know, I think if when people are like, oh, but it's so much work to have all these kingdoms, I'm like, work to who? Maybe the work is the problem. Maybe it shouldn't be so hard. Maybe the kingdom should be smaller. Maybe it shouldn't be so difficult to do these things because mm -hmm. you're not trying to accommodate as many people. Me, you know, I think I'm actually really a fan of this idea of just let's make everything a little more intimate, a little more personal and closer so that people have access. That means though that my apprentice in China needs to move back <laughs> to Western Washington. <laughs> Intent. <laughs> thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> so we're nearly at the end of our time. And one of the questions that we do like to ask is, what is one of your favorite campfire stories to share? So it's, it's one of your favorite memories or stories. Of Nita or of the SCA? Uh, of of whatever you like. You can you can do both. Because yeah. Nita squatting on that <laughs> ball was <Yeah>. absolutely <laughs> hands down one of my favorite moments ever. <laughs> that would have been hilarious to watch. I love that. <laughs> it was really funny. I don't know. I've had so many SCA experiences um, that are just lovely. Um, I've seen some really cool stuff. I've seen some less cool stuff. Um, I mean, raining was amazing. You know, I've, I've, I don't know. I don't know that I like listening to other people's stories. I don't know that I would um, have my own story. I like trying to get other people to do stuff and trying like, if I were sitting at that campfire, I would be like, hey, who's here who knows stuff? I want to see if I can get them to talk about it. So <laughs> so that's, many stories yeah that's fun for me and I I think also um there's people that are just better at it than I am you know I'm good at having opinions more so than storytelling so but I act on my opinion so <laughs> it's not all talk <laughs> in fact one of the things that I do often for people is they'll ask me for assistance in wordsmithing things or in if a problem needs to be solved, it's one of my, it's one of my, I don't know about superpowers, but it's definitely one of the things that I am willing to help people do is to unravel issues. Cause I don't have, I, I have lots of, you know, social capital. I have lots of privilege and I'm perfectly happy to flex it on behalf of people that don't. Um, that's fun for me. And, um, you know, and it's something I'm good at and something I'm willing to do. So that's not a story, but that's a fact. How about you, Nia? Um, one of the things that I enjoyed a lot was during one particular reign, there were many antics because every once in a while you get a king or queen who have a lot of personality on their own outside of 
raining and um, I like to write satire occasionally when things happen. Some people use the word scathing. I try to not do that, but if that's how it's, it's scadian. perceived. I just... Scady, scadian, not scathing. Oh. <laughs> but one of the things that I would do is I would tell a story, but I replace the human characters with animals. And then I love it. Um, I made some paper uh, poster board uh, animals that was a cast I could use anytime I needed. So there was a badger and there was a raven and there was a fox and many different characters. And we call our porta potties Biffies. And so I would like to do at smaller events, Biffy Side Theater, where I have a particular skirt that has a front panel that kind of looks like an apron, but it's white. And then I have a harness sort of contraption where I can pull my skirt up over my head and then turn the light on, which is usually just sort of on my uh, chest, like a necklace, like a book light. And then I just uh, write the satire that I have. Usually my husband will read it for me because it's hard for me to read the story and manipulate the puppet. So he's been trained. So he reads and he does the voices. And then I'm inside with my, I usually have some kind of like white with red hearts bloomers on. And then just my skirt up and then the puppets tell whatever story just sort of right here. Um, I I'm not pretty that. good at it. And then I was even able to do a, a story at a daylight event. If it's not cloudy and you have full sun, you can angle your uh, stage so the sun shines down at the right angle. You can project your shadows just right there on the. So I do skirt over the head theater or Biffy side theater. Very popular, but I haven't been able to do it in a really long time probably far too long, but it was a hit mm -hmm. in small groups. The hula hoop. Yeah, and it was always in The hula hoop theater was also very funny. Yeah, that's, I had to put a hula hoop in the hem of the skirt to hold it up. Like, and then there's like sticks that I've, I made a bodice with little uh, stick holders so that I could just rest the hula hoop. <laughs> I mean, I tried to be all natural. I spent a whole summer like getting these cedar branches and like curving them. And then it, it was just ridiculous trying to be authentic with Biffy side theater. So I was like, all right, it's just a hula hoop now. I can't deal with <laughs> trying to naturally source these ingredients for my comedy show. So, I mean, there's a point where you're like, oh, I want to be myth medieval and authentic. And then you try all these things and then it's like, no one knows that it's a hula hoop or actual wood hoop, like, and they don't care. They just want to watch you make a fool of yourself and tell a funny story. And then that's really what they're there for. They're not like, mm. oh, she's so authentic with her. <laughs> Did you know she wove that apron herself? No, nobody cares. <laughs> and I didn't, but somebody I know did weave me a towel that I love. I wear as an apron, but it's not for shadow theater. It's too thick. Yeah. <laughs> but that it rains a lot in Ontario, so the yeah. hula hoop's probably a better option anyway. Yeah. So I yeah. do like the hula hoop well, idea. I really, really am a fan of that. <laughs> I think you guys should um once things are open again, you should try and lure Nita down to events in your kingdom, uh, since oh. it's practically next door. I mean, uh, I'm more than welcome to come and do stuff. Yeah, and New Zealand first though, we're so much, you know, it's much better. No, because there's not a whole lot of deadly things like there are. Right? <laughs> Nine out of the 10 most deadly creatures in the world in Australia. No, that's, that's just We didn't snakes. even talk about that. But, but you no. know, they stay away from you. Don't, don't worry about the spiders. You, you have spiders. things in the water. You have yeah. things on land, you have things on webs. There's so many things there. I've seen all the 99 most deadly animals in the world type documentaries. And often the top like 20, most of them are in Australia. Yeah. And we whereas, have cute little birds that don't fly. So whereas New Zealand have crazy possums, 
and you guys and birds, yeah, came from your country. Yeah. Yeah, we like to, you know, export. But you in guys Washington, have bears. We have what? What? I, no. You've got yeah. black bears. No, 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 no. They have the bears. Octopus. It's the arboreal, the arboreal octopus you have to watch out for here because the tree octopus is very dangerous. And they like drop bears? All of our most dangerous, all of our most dangerous animals are imaginary. So Sasquatch and um, jackalopes and tree octopus. Um, there are bears here, but do you think I've, I mean, you might see a juvenile black bear occasionally if your property has encroached on their territory, which you deserve that if that's what happens to you. But I have never seen a bear outside of a zoo in my life. So never. We, like you don't, and, and this is the thing, we talk about all of the deadly animals in Australia. They run away from you. Um, if there are spiders, the are like spiders. They hide and you squirt them with stuff. I saw that funnel spiders live in the arms of um, lawn chairs in Sydney. Yeah, that's why you like don't live to... in Sydney. Okay, okay, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I've seen all of your yeah. Let's Keep People Away from Australia documentaries. And they did their, they definitely worked. In, in the Pacific Northwest here in the United States, we do have a few things. We do have rattlesnakes, but they're super easy to avoid because they literally tell you they're there. Um, we do have a couple of different kinds of spiders, but they're not, these are like, ow, oh, that hurt. Maybe I, it gets infected and maybe it's painful. Like, but it's not, it's not that big of a deal. And um, other than that, you know, we do have a lot of um, charismatic megafauna, which is like your bears, orcas, you know. Um, There's some cougars in East Cougars, Atlanta. yeah, and coyotes aren't really megafauna. I mean, we don't, we just don't have, that's why people like to live here. It's like the weather can be pretty crummy half the year, but um there's not a lot of stuff trying to kill you. There's wildfires, but you guys know about that. And we do have more than your average share of um, serial killers here, but that's yeah, you can have a look at I don't hear any of those here. I mean, no. they, they might be, but we don't know of any. We have a, very, a couple, but you're very no, unlikely. Like to them. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah. unlikely. And I'm being I'm being blithe about that. It is very serious, I, but it is serious. <laughs> We actually, that is actually a myth. We don't have any more than anywhere else here, but it's kind of the reputation. Um, oh, I don't know. I, I follow, you know, I've, I've done a bit of research on that and, and some of those big names. Some of them. that area. Yeah. It's true, but not all of them. But also the Pacific Northwest is a terrible place. Nobody should move here. It's horrible. The weather's horrible. The everything is horrible here you don't want to come here it's expensive the people are mean and um don't don't try to move here i feel the same way about new zealand i mean it's horrible horrible it is, place it's awful. I've, only, I've been here for 17 years i don't know why i stay because it's terrible yeah. the weather's awful have you it's seen actually the a joke. i mean really Hobbit. it's a joke because in our in the um, grace under under pressure interviews that we were doing yeah. and and also, I have another show called Ask Annie Frith's Bottom. That's an advice show, but you can only watch those if you become part of the Facebook group because we wanted to keep it just SCA only. But um, though we do talk about our retirement program here, that if somebody mm -hmm. um, that we interview seems to be like really good material, we'll send them a retirement package so that they can come to the Pacific Northwest when they're ready to retire. Um, I doubt we're going to be able to lure either of you out here, but if you know anyone, you know. Oh, I, I plan on visiting. Yes, Please absolutely. do. Please yeah, do. We'd absolutely. Love I keep my options open, you know. Okay. All right. been, I went over for Sport of Kings in 2017. Okay. Yeah, I think it was then. Yes. I was there. I'm sad that we didn't bond instantly. Um, I was. I was very insular and quiet okay. and shy. A little, little quiet wallflower? Right? I, well, I was, 
I always have an oven with me at SCA events where I'm camping a proper oven, like it's propane, but you can bake stuff in it. And we make nachos every time at Sporta King. <gasps> I'm totally there. I'm, I'm there. We're there. The next time you come to it, be sure to plan for some nacho shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. So okay. you definitely need to have Sport of Kings like next year when I would our love border that. will open. And I'd like Nita to be back in the country for it. Yes. Yes. It's a plan. Sport of Kings always but, happens Because there's definitely quite a few people. people. By then. Mm. She's usually gone by August, but um, oh well. <laughs> Well, we've okay. kind of run a bit over time. We uh, have. Lindsay, um, do you want to sign us out? I'll let you do the, the big Why, one. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. It has actually been an amazing um, interview and getting to know you mm. both quite a bit and the passion that you both have, not only for the SCA and for your interests, but for each other, really, and mm. that that bond that you have is phenomenal and you can definitely see it coming across. And thank you to everybody who has watched today. Uh, please join oh, us next you. Friday night where uh, in um, Australian time where we interview Duchess Yolande, which will be an awesome interview. She is the, uh, the children's queen over here. Mm, so fabulous. thank you very much. Uh, enjoy your- And next Saturday with Duke Alpha. Oh, Duke Alpha next Saturday, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for watching everyone um, and take care, stay safe and be COVID free. Bye. Make good choices. Hi, Dada.